Friday, February 28th, 1997. Two professional bank robbers overtake a North Hollywood branch in Los Angeles. Sporting a military-grade arsenal and covered nearly head to toe in body armor. And as fate would have it, an LAPD officer in the right place at the right time witnessed the moment the gunman entered the bank. The police soon had the men surrounded, expecting the men to barricade inside. But instead, the two robbers swiftly exited the bank, spraying over a thousand rounds at police. Over 44 minutes in 2,000 rounds exchanged, the streets of North Hollywood turned in to a living hell. The two gunmen behind the North Hollywood shootout first met at a Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, California. Larry Phillips Jr., a Los Angeles native and proficient real estate scammer, and Emil Matasarino, a Romanian immigrant and college graduate with an above average IQ. They were close in age and talked everything weightlifting and bodybuilding and uh, whatever else the fuck gym rats uh, talk about. Uh, chicken breasts, probably. Despite the contrast of their upbringings, the two quickly became close friends outside of the gym. They bonded over firearms, philosophical ideas, they talked about their tough childhoods, and their mutual hatred for authority. As Larry Phillips Jr. grew up around an ex-convict father who struggled with the law, and Matasarino, who grew up watching his home country of Romania violently collapse in 1989 on live TV. Their hatred for the world and the figures who ran it ran deep. In October of 1993, the two found themselves in some serious trouble when they were traffic stopped by an undercover Glendale detective while operating a stolen rental car. When the detective made contact with the vehicle, Phillips gave the officer a fake name. He then asked the men who the vehicle belonged to, to which Matasarino replied that the vehicle belonged to Phillips' mother. And after making checks, the detective ordered Phillips to step out of his vehicle, at which point the detective located a Glock 17 with a 33-round extended magazine in Phillips' waistband. Matasarino still inside the vehicle, then tucked his pistol beneath the seat. Backup arrived and both men were taken into custody. The vehicle was seized and a laundry list of weapons and suspicious items were recovered from within, ranging from a Norinco, 1,700 rounds of 7.62, three Chinese-made 75-round drum magazines, six smoke bombs, two IEDs, a gas mask, wigs, three different California license plates, and two spray cans of gray hair coloring. That's right, these jokers were locked and loaded with some just for men. Now it's a party. Larry Phillips was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery, grand theft auto, unlawful weapons activity, carrying a loaded and concealed firearm, and felony perjury. On December 27th, both men were only sentenced to less than one year in jail. On June 14th, 1995, in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Winnetka, at approximately 12 p.m., Phillips and Matasarinu stalked a Brinks truck. They followed the armored vehicle until it made a stop. They watched as the guard got out and made a delivery. As the guard returned and opened the back doors of the armored truck and was at his most vulnerable, Phillips and Matasarinu opened fire with AK-47s. Both guards were shot and $120,000 was stolen. The Brinks guards luckily survived, and the robbery quickly made headlines. Given the level of violence, tactics deployed, and weaponry used, the FBI took exceptional interest, who they deemed at the time the AK-47 bandits. And it wasn't long until they struck again. On March 27, 1996, in the area of Woodland Hills, Phillips and Matasarino attempted to overtake another Brinks truck, but miserably failed. They once again stalked the armored vehicle and opened fire after it stopped, but the driver took off. They chased the vehicle briefly before fleeing the scene, and once they got away, they ditched their vehicle and set it on fire. Despite the recent failure, only two months later, the men graduated to bank robbery. And on the morning of May 2nd, they initiated their first ever takeover heist. They kicked open the bank doors, fired warning shots into the ceiling, swept the vault, and walked out in under six minutes with nearly $750,000. And high on success after making it out clean, they hit their second score only 29 days later, 
on the morning of May 31st, Phillips and Matasarinu took over a Bank of America branch in Winnetka. Walking out once again with just under $800,000, accumulating a net worth of approximately $1.6 million in 30 days. And by this point, the FBI Violent Crimes Task Force and local law enforcement were rattled. The suspects were virtually uncatchable. It was evident that the two robbers had gone from violent outlaws to swift professionals in a short period of time, prompting the FBI to change the duo's name from the AK-47 Bandits to the High Incident Bandits. Over the next several months, a massive joint operation spanning multiple law enforcement agencies within Los Angeles County sent officers to stage outside of banks and other potential targets of the high incident bandits. But the robbers at the time went on hiatus, upgrading their arsenal and mostly planning their biggest score yet. Phillips and Matasarinu narrowed down their options to Branch 384 of Bank of America, located in North Hollywood, California. It was the largest bank in the area by far and had the potential to net them at least $2 million for 10 minutes work. It was the optimal location for many reasons. Professional bank robbers tend to hit branches located on street corners for a better escape egress. Branch 384 was a single building lot, meaning not only was it a corner branch, but it had two corners of the lot, with both freeway access nearby and city side streets leading into the valley. It was the perfect stage for the perfect heist. They chose the date of Friday, February 28th, and they loaded up for war. They attached level 3A Kevlar body armor to the front and back of both their torso and extremities, basically making them pretty much invincible against the police who have 9mm. And speaking of bullets, holy shit! They loaded out with Norinkos with full auto conversions, 75 round Chinese magazine drums, a semi-auto HK91, two Berettas, and a fucking Bushmaster XM15 dissipate. They then loaded several thousand rounds of spare ammunition into the trunk of their white 1987 Chevrolet Celebrity. And both men knew there was no going back. They dug their graves in their past robberies, and after getting busted once, they knew they would be facing life in prison, unspoken, but likely even fearful of one another, and the idea of their counterpart cooperating with authorities in exchange for a lighter sentencing. They knew from here on out, contact with law enforcement could only end one way. And on the morning of the robbery, the men each took an unknown dosage of phenobarbital, a central nervous system depressant to basically master chief the shit out of their nerves. They suited up, drove to the bank, synchronized their watches, and at 9.17 a.m., Larry Phillips and Emil Mastorinu clashed through the doors of Branch 384, firing rounds into the ceiling and declaring aloud, this is a fucking holdup. While on routine patrol, as fate would have it, LAPD patrol officer Martin Perello entered the bank's intersection of Archwood and Agnes when he spotted the two heavily armed gunmen entering the bank at 9.17 a.m. And just like that, the milliseconds before the heist started, it was already over. Inside the bank, the gunmen took over while continuing to open fire into the ceiling. And after gaining everyone's compliance, Phillips and Matasarinu began shooting at the bulletproof door that gave access to the bank tellers and the vault. The door, which was only made to withstand small caliber ammunition, broke open after a few shots from their modified Norinkos. The men then forced the tellers to fill their bags with the money from the vault. As they held the door, watching over their shoulders, they realized there was a big problem. There was way less money in the vault than they had anticipated. The adrenaline partnered with the intense stress led the two men to unravel, and bursts of gunfire continued solely out of rage. Matasarinu became so enraged that he emptied a 75-round drum magazine into the vault, destroying the rest of the money. In total, the tellers only packed $303,000. 
Meanwhile, outside of the bank, LAPD officers Perello and Farrell enter the perimeter of a parking lot across the street and are soon joined by multiple officers rushing in to the area. An anxious Larry Phillips noticed the silence outside of the bank. There was no longer any foot traffic outside or even a single car on the usually busy roadway. He walked halfway out of the bank and heard nothing but the freeway noise coming from a half a mile away. And in that moment, he realized the police were waiting. At which point both men could hear sirens of the cavalry of the LAPD responding, as well as the sound of exploding die packs in the money bags, rendering the bills completely useless. The officers outside were coordinating what they thought would be a barricade situation until Larry Phillips stormed out of the North ATM lobby entrance, spraying rounds at officers with his Narinka, immediately injuring seven officers and three civilians from 200 feet away. They returned fire at the robbers, but their 9mm had little effect on the heavily armed gunmen. LAPD officer James Aborvan, only a few months out of the academy, gets a shot off on Phillips, wounding him. The gunman turns his attention to Zaborovan, who dives across his fellow officers, blocking the shot. He then seeks cover into a nearby dental office, where a dentist by the name of Jorge Montez quickly turns his dental office into a makeshift emergency room. And at this time, the elite members of the prestigious LAPD SWAT team arrived on scene. Many of the members at the time were even founding fathers of the LAPD's first ever SWAT team, who had a fierce reputation and a highly successful rate of solving the problems within high-risk incidents. Phillips retrieves the HK-91 and begins sniping news helicopters with 308, hitting a KCAL-9 chopper's rear stabilizer until a group of officers who raided a nearby gun store to obtain higher caliber weapons returned and landed a shot on the HK-91, disabling it. Phillips picked back up his Norinco until his weapon stovepiped. Not knowing how to clear the malfunction, he pulled out his Beretta and continued firing at police. And suddenly, realizing it was the end, Larry Phillips took his own Beretta and ended his life. Matasa Renu tried to escape by hijacking a civilian's truck, but failed. The SWAT team saw this and took advantage of Matasa Renu's exposed position and moved in to engage him while taking cover behind a patrol vehicle. The SWAT team opened fire, but they couldn't find an angle on Matasa Renu, taking cover behind the engine block of his vehicle. LAPD SWAT officer Rick Massa decided to prone out and found the exposed feet of Matasa Renu. Got a good sight picture and opened fire, hitting Matasa Renu twice in the ankle. Matasa Renu collapsed and began skipping rounds towards the SWAT team from beneath the vehicle while laying on his back. And with Matasa Renu's body now exposed and still skipping rounds towards SWAT officers, the SWAT team opened fire. And after being shot 29 times, Matasa Renu surrenders to police. As they secure Matas Renu's weapon and place him in handcuffs to search for additional weapons, Officer Rick Massa stands over him. Matas Renu looks up at Massa and asks him to finish him off, to which Officer Massa declines and says, I'll see you in court. Matas Renu succumbed to his wounds and died 56 minutes later. As the deadly shootout came to an end, the SWAT team entered the Bank of America to rescue the employees and customers from the vault. After the incident occurred, the LAPD realized the importance of firepower after realizing their nine millimeters fucking sucked. And they received 600 M16s from the Pentagon, officially birthing the requirement of patrol rifles. One year after the incident occurred, 19 LAPD officers received medals of valor and were even commended by then-president Bill Clinton. Despite the injuries, the shootout is regarded as a success for police, who were severely outgunned and managed to prevent any civilian or officer fatalities. The pop culture and lore of the North Hollywood shootout runs deep. From a Megadeth song to a made-for-TV movie, countless documentaries to an op-ed in Rolling Stone magazine, 
It's estimated that Phillips and Matasarinu fired close to 1,200 rounds, with the LAPD returning close to 650 rounds. The North Hollywood Shootout will always be regarded as one of the most dangerous confrontations between robbers and police that America has ever seen. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more of these videos in the works. And I'm also excited to announce my podcast, The Aftermath Podcast, where we'll be breaking down episodes over a longer format. So be sure to subscribe over there as well. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching and putting up with my sick voice. All right, goodbye.